Hello, everyone, and welcome to SSUC Online for November the 14th, 2021, where we are together, spiritual seekers, united in community, gathering as virtual community, real need for serenity and strength. Wherever you are this morning, whether you're alone or with others in your household, whether you're in your living room, seated at your dining room table, in your office, at your desk, seated at your kitchen table, wherever you are, thank you for taking this time to pause with us, to open to the gift of music, to the wisdom we hear in words ancient and new, to sing and pray our way into this new day together. Joining me in greeting you today is my teammate Christopher New, who's also our pianist today. And we have in this room a representative choir leading us in song this morning. We welcome the voices of Blair and Heidi and Pam to the power of two and Janice and Jeff. We welcome Deb uh, accompanying our choir as they offer us a special piece of music along with Janet on the cello. We thank each of you for being with us, for uh, Noah and Andrea in the booth doing their magic to bring us all together in this platform with each other. We're continuing our series, Finding Our Footing, the obstacles and opportunities of change. And today we reflect on the work of change in our lives. And as we pause to recalibrate, to reorient our lives, to breathe into this time with all of its shifts, sometimes it's abrupt changes, sometimes it's gentle turnings, in all of its beauty and its heartbreak, we take this time to let go of all that tugs at our hearts and all that fills our minds. And we choose to take our place mindfully with the land we call home. As we honor the first peoples of our land, for us in Edmonton and Saskatoon, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, traditional meeting ground, gathering place and traveling route of Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Diné and the Dakota Sioux peoples. And wherever you are, whether you live on treaty lands or unceded territory, I invite you to consider where your feet are placed, where your heart calls home, and together as indigenous, immigrants, and refugees, may we be blessed by this sacred land and healing water with which we seek to live with greater respect and more mutuality. As we do each time we gather with our trust in that possibility and in our confidence with all that lightens our darkness, I invite us each to light a candle where we are today. I light this candle for those of us gathered here in this room, joining you where you are. May our lights be for us a symbol of hope and courage as we honor the relationship between light and darkness each of them bringing their gifts to us, each an agent of our transformation, our daily teachers, through all the shades of change our lives will hold.
This is the time, this is the place to refresh and renew in a mindful space. Others around who also have found our connections in life as the common ground. Much wisdom to share. This morning's time for all ages comes to us in the form of a story, a book, but it reflects something that happened for real. I'm going to share with you the story called The Man with the Violin. It's written by Kathy Stinson and illustrated by Dushan Patrier. Dylan was someone who noticed things. His mom was someone who didn't. One Friday in January was a day like any other until music. The high notes soar to the ceiling. The low notes swoop to the floor. All the notes swirl and sweep around the blur of people rushing here and rushing there. The music is telling an exciting story. It makes the hair on the back of Dylan's neck tickle. Mom, wait! The man with the violin sways this way and that. His fingers move quickly. His bow dances across the strings. The skittering notes make Dylan want to dance, too. Then the music slows and the man's eyes close, as if the music is carrying him from bustle, bustle, bustle to somewhere far, far away. Please, Mom, can't we stop? Please? If only they could listen for even a minute. Not today. The man with the violin leans forward. His music makes Dylan's skin hum. Someone begins shouting, blibbity blabbity blah, 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 blah. Dylan leans toward the musician trying to hear. From the violin comes the saddest sound he has ever heard. The man turns in his direction. Their eyes lock. But the escalator pulls Dylan down, 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 and away. 
bursting out of the tunnel, a loud clattering. Dylan strains to hear the music, but grrrr, rumble, rumble. The train gobbles up the faint notes with its roar. All day, the music Dylan heard that morning plays in his head. On the way home, he says, Mom, do you think maybe that man will still be there? His mom says, what man? Rain patters. Dishes clatter. A voice on the radio drones on and on. Until suddenly, music. Telling a story that makes the apartment bigger and brighter. And Dylan shouts, that's the man in the station. The music fades. The voice on the radio says, Today, over a thousand people had the chance to hear one of the finest musicians in the world. Joshua Bell was playing some of the most elegant music ever written on one of the most valuable violins ever made. Yet few people listened for even a minute. Dylan says, I knew it! We should have stopped! We should have listened! Into a pot of bubbling water spills the spaghetti. Again, the musical story slips and slides through the air, and Dylan can almost see the man with the violin standing on tiptoes to reach the high notes. Dylan, you're right. His mom turns up the radio. Loud and sweet, the music fills every corner of the apartment, and together, Dylan and his mom dance. And together, finally, they listen. Joshua Bell is a real person. When he was four, he tried to make music like he heard on his parents' records by plucking rubber bands that he put on the handles of his dresser drawers. So his parents signed him up for violin lessons right away. And one of the songs he taught himself was the Sesame Street theme song. He gave his first symphony orchestra concert when he was seven. And now as a grown-up, Joshua Bell has given concerts all over the world. One of his favorite memories is getting to appear on Sesame Street when he got to play Sing After Me with Telly Monster on tuba. People pay hundreds of dollars for a ticket to hear Joshua play in a concert hall. But one day he went down to the subway and didn't tell anyone he was there and didn't wear his fancy clothes. And he played for almost an hour. And you know what? Only seven people stopped to listen. And Joshua himself, after the fact, said that he could see during the time he was playing that almost every child who passed by wanted to listen, but their grown-ups rushed on to their destinations. Music is like a lot of things. It has the power to leave us changed. But we need to stop and listen. If only we stop and notice. Stop and allow our hearts to be changed.
I want to share with you a poem written by an American poet who was in his 70s when he wrote these words. He lived to be just a few months shy of his 101st birthday. On two occasions, he held the post of U.S. Poet Laureate. Stanley Kunitz, reflecting on his t experience of life, as a 72-year-old man, thinking back over the losses and change, wrote this poem entitled, The Layers. I have walked through many lives, some of them my own, and I am not who I was. Though some principle of being abides, from which I struggle not to stray. When I look behind, as I'm compelled to look before I can gather strength to proceed on my journey, I see the milestones dwindling toward the horizon, and the slow fires trailing from abandoned campsites, over which scavenger angels wheel on heavy wings. Oh, I have made of myself a tribe out of my true affections, and my tribe is scattered. How shall the heart be reconciled to its feast of losses? In a rising wind, the manic dust of my friends, those who fell along the way, bitterly stings my face. Yet I turn. I turn, exalting somewhat with my heart intact, to go wherever I need to go. And every stone on the road, precious to me, in my darkest night, when the moon was covered and I roamed through wreckage, a nimbus clouded voice directed me, live in the layers, not on the litter. Though I lack the art to decipher it, no doubt the next chapter in my book of transformations is already written. I am not done with my changes. In these wise words of a poet, may we too find wisdom for our living.
Let my voice join your voice. Let my song join your song. Let our hearts be together As we sing, as we share, let this be our prayer. Let our voices be voices that care. Let our words be kind words. Let our truths be our love. May we serve others all of our days. And as long as we live, this the pledge we give. God, our voice, render means and ways. Let us sing out, sing to In my darkest night, when the moon was covered and I roamed through wreckage, a nimbus clouded voice directed me, live in the layers, not on the litter. Though I lack the art to decipher it, no doubt the next chapter in my book of transformations is already written. I am not done with my changes. I've always loved the story of an ancient archetypal character who in his darkest night also heard a nimbus clouded voice. As the ancient story goes, for nearly three decades, Jacob had been running from the disappointed face of his father and the enraged face of his brother. After he'd stolen the only things of real value in his ancient culture, he had masqueraded as his twin brother and tricked his blind father into giving him the birthright and the blessing that belonged to his firstborn brother. And then just before his deceit met the light of day, he packed his bags with his family's treasures and he left home to face the life work of living with himself. 
He met himself in the mirror when he met his father-in-law, a man who actually bested him by tricking Jacob into marrying the sister of the woman he loved. After living on the litter of his mistakes for more than 30 years, Jacob decides to make amends with his family. And like so many archetypal stories go, he began the long journey home. The night before he is to cross the final river and start down the driveway to knock on the door of his brother, he's got plenty of reasons to be anxious. So his plan is to get a good night's sleep. Wake up bright and early. Rehearse his apology one more time. And carry with him the hope that his brother has a short memory and a big heart. And if he can get past his brother's rage, he's pretty sure his father will bury the hatchet quickly and open his arms to welcome his son home. As the story goes, after Jacob sends his wives and his children and his servants and all of his livestock on ahead, his darkest night of the soul begins in earnest. Instead of sleep, he spends the night wrestling with his better self, a stranger within. And this is how that mystical story in our Hebrew scriptures goes. When Jacob was left alone, a stranger wrestled with him until daybreak. When the stranger saw he couldn't defeat Jacob, he struck his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then the stranger said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he answered, Jacob. And the man said, you'll no longer be called Jacob, but from now on your name is Israel, for you have survived the supreme struggle and you are no longer the one they called Jacob. A nimbus clouded voice could just as easily have said, live in the layers, not on the litter. Live in the layers you build of learnings, on failures and achievements, the layers of mistakes and missteps, and limp in the light, alive to the book of transformations, the plot which each new day is, alive to the never-ending work of change, alive to knowing that change is not done with you yet. I'd like to tell you that in the world of the ancient story, they all lived happily ever after. But really, who can say how this story ends? This is a story that never happened and a story that's always happening. This is a story we know didn't happen just this way, but we know this story is true. And we know this story is still being written in our book of transformations. The story of our species isn't finished yet. The story of our universe isn't finished yet. The story of our land isn't finished yet. The story of our spiritual community isn't finished yet. And the story of our lives isn't finished yet. 
we might still be in that darkest night as we roam through the wreckage where it seems easier to spot the litter than to find beauty in the pattern of a layer. But the work of change isn't done with us yet. We know Jacob's story is not only a man's story or a woman's story. It's not only a personal narrative. It's the story of every empire, every structure, every oppressor, of whoever and whatever holds all the cards. It's the story of the sacred struggle to make human life human and earth community livable, possible. It's the story of each of us and all of us who could build a livable layer for those who come after us, not merely a mess of litter for another generation to try to clean up. To make of our lives a layer that leaves the world better than we found it, to walk back through the many lives we've lived, to find the way to reconcile our heart to its feast of losses, to make peace with the good and the bad fortunes of the past. Jacob didn't swagger into a new day. The story says he limped knowing his wounds and his wounding self. But somehow he was humbled by this struggle and was invited to be forever changed. He came to the family that he had wounded differently. He came as a different person than the one who'd run from the hurt and the rage so many years before. The story doesn't let him return with the same name because he is a different person. This tale would really be a tragedy in its entirety if each character in the story failed to be changed by the choices and the chances that shaped their lives. As I've shared with some of you before, one of my great teachers in the work of change was a widow who had been schooled by life. She would have considered herself a very plain woman, a farm girl who married for a way out, not for love, a hardworking wife and mother who struggled all her life to make ends meet. A woman who in her 90s had outlived so many of her friends, had outlived her husband and two of her three children. When she told me her life, she told it this way. I was always against divorce and then all of my children divorced. I was always against abortion, and then my granddaughter had an abortion. I was always against homosexuality, and then my favorite nephew told me he was gay. I guess you could say, I've lived long enough to change my mind about just about everything. I heard these words when I was in midlife, and they struck a deep chord with me as I walked through the many lives of who I had been even to those years of my life. I had changed my mind about many things. I changed my heart about many things. And now a wise older woman came to me as a nimbus clouded voice inviting me to live in the layers, not on the litter, 
to let me make peace with the mistakes I'd made, to make peace with the ideas that I'd propagated, the beliefs that had shaped me, the choices I'd embraced, and to celebrate that I was no longer where I started. Isn't that the measure to be taken? Choosing to compact the litter into layers, to gather the goodness of all those ecological eras of our lives, those geological layers of our lives, to see the broken pieces in relationship with one another, to limp over some of those precious stones of memory, learning as we go, to find our footing, shifting for equilibrium in trying to find the way forward, knowing that change is the work of our lives and it is the grace of our living. It's the bane and the blessing of a being with breath. So in the company of all our teachers, all who have limped through reconciling their hearts to its feast of losses, and the grace of so many second chances. Let's give ourselves to the work of living in the layers on the amazing grace of life.
as we strengthen our intentions today, I want to share with you a prayer that is attributed to Reinhold Neighbor, written just after or in the years of the Second World War. Words that have been adopted by so many 12-step programs, words that resonate with us, of living with the changes, the work of change in our lives. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer as I offer these words with us? May we find the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference Patience for the things that take time. Gratitude for all that we have. And empathy for those with different struggles. The freedom to live beyond the limitation of our past ways. The ability to feel loved and to feel love for one another. And the strength to persevere. May it be so. Amen. I have some invitations to share with you today, the first of which is to join us in an informal conversation on Zoom shortly after the end of our gathering this morning at about 11.15, an opportunity just for us to reflect with one another on the theme of our morning to talk with each other about the things that we resonate with, the things that challenge us, the things that speak to us, and an opportunity to share our prayers of concern and our prayers of gratitude with one another. We uh, take about 45 minutes together and we invite you to join us at, at about 11.15 by calling in on Zoom. You'll find the link on our website. We also, look forward to welcoming you back into this space in person two weeks from today, beginning on the 28th of November. There's an opportunity to register so that we can know you're coming and we can keep each other safe by keeping our numbers in this room to a maximum of 60 people. And so we invite you to go on our website to register for the Sundays that you would like to be here. You'll find currently that registration is open for all of the Sundays uh, up to Christmas Eve, including our Blue Christmas service on the Wednesday evening uh, coming towards the Christmas season. We'll have a little bit more to share with you about uh, Christmas Eve gatherings and how to register for those a little bit further on in December, but for now, we invite you to let us know, those of you that would like to be with us in person, and for all of you to know that you can continue to be with us online. Nothing will change in terms of our online presence. We'll continue to be with each other with an option to be here in person for those who choose to do so. It's just about time again for our second annual cookie drive through You can pre-order your cookies this week up until November 18th. It's just $15 per box. We're about two-thirds of the way to our goal in terms of the sale of cookies, and we're just shy a few dozen of our goal of a thousand dozen cookies to have for sale. So if some of you are able to bake a few more dozen, or some of you haven't had an opportunity yet to sign up to bake, please be in touch with us to do that. And um, we encourage all of you to order some cookies that you can gift to friends and family, cookies that uh, you can share in the Christmas season. They uh, will be picked up from this location on December the 4th, between the hours of 10 in the morning and noon. The Cookie Walk is one of our fundraisers that we have been able to do during this um, COVID time, and we appreciate and welcome and need the support that you can give us financially. 
there are many ways to support us. The Cookie Walk is one. We rely on your donations to help us provide this uh, gathering, to provide our music program, to support our outreach programs. And so you'll see on your screen a variety of ways that you can donate, whether it's a one-time gift or a regular gift. We so appreciate and need and rely on the support that each of you are able to do, whether that is great or small. Thank you for what you are able to do, and um, we hope that you will see an opportunity in these coming weeks as 2021 comes to a close to offer some financial support. As we come to close our time together, I want to give our final word today to Parker Palmer. Parker Palmer, as many of you will know, is an educator, a writer, a wise elder, a Quaker, a man of deep spirituality, an elder voice now in his 80s. And as he reflected on this poem of Stanley Kunitz, and in particular, the line about living in the layers, not on the litter. This is what he wrote. It brings to mind three times I've taken the 10-day rafting trip through the Grand Canyon. If you make a trip with a geologist as I did, you'll learn that the layers of rock that make up the walls of the canyon are not only beautiful, they're a record of the canyon's ancient history with each layer telling the story of a different geological era. It seems to me that our lives take us through different geological eras. Each one leaves a layer of evidence about what happened during that time, about what we did and what was done to us. Of course, most of us have eras we just as soon forget. And becoming preoccupied with the litter that's always on the surface of our lives gives us an easy excuse to do exactly that but we become whole when we have the courage to revisit and embrace all the layers of our lives, denying none of them, so that we're finally able to say, yes, all of this is me, and all of this has helped me make me who I am. When we get to that point, amazingly, we can look at all the layers together 
and see the beauty of the whole. So live in the layers, not in the litter. It's good counsel at any stage of life. And so we go to do just that. In this day and in the days to come, may you be well, may you be whole, may you be at peace, may you have strength for each moment in the daily bread of living in the layers, not on the litter. <laughs>